Okay, let's now continue on uh, the next part of the curriculum, uh, chapter two in uh, the textbook, uh, which is about uh, forecasting and different types of forecasting uh, methods. Uh, these slides, as mentioned, these are given by the authors of the textbook, and uh, I will upload uh, the relevant slides on Frontier uh, before the lecture, chapter-wise, uh, and then use some of them in, uh, uh, in the lectures. Uh, and then you should also use the slides as uh, some kind of uh, supplement to the textbook because uh, not our all topics are very uh, de detailed described and uh, also some well some some the textbook will will give some more details and much more examples than what is actually uh, given on on the slides here but uh, there would uh, would be also some relevant information and some kind of summary on some of the topics which might be uh, might be, be relevant for, for you to, uh, to look on and also prepare for, for the lectures. Uh, first, some uh, general introduction to, uh, to forecasting and uh, the first slides here and also the sub-chapters from 2.1 to 2.5 is not uh, actually defined as the curriculum, but this will be some kind of background information for forecasting, so I recommend you to read it, even if it's not defined directly as the curriculum. And then, general views on forecasting. Here, we have the introduction, the question, what is forecasting? And the answer will then be some kind of primary function to predict the future. Forecasting is, can be very simple in some kind of markets, some products. It can be very difficult in, in other types of, of markets. Uh, and of course, the uh, importance of a good forecasting method is uh, uh, it's much higher when you have, uh, have a, a very uh, difficult uh, forecasting, a high degree of so-called stochasticity or uncertainty, that uh, the demand is, uh, is uh, varying from time period to time period. And of course, why we are interested in forecasting is because this will affect the decision we make today. If we have a good forecast, we can detailed plan how much to keep on stock, how much to buy for each uh, order, or eventually, if you are producing yourself, how much to produce in each batch, and so on. And the forecast, a good forecast, will then affect the, the decision and the, a bad inventory uh, policy or uh, uh, policy on other uh, parts of the in the supply chain will be uh, costly and uh, if you have a good forecast you are much better prepared for making good policies on, on the different parts of the supply chain. So who uses forecasting in the jobs? Well you have forecast demand uh, for products and services, you have the availability of manpower also quite important, how many people should you um, employ or how many should you uh, um, should you put on the different parts of, of the, the works according to what kind of forecast you have and also forecast inventory and material needs on a daily or uh, another time period basis. So you have one major characteristic of forecast and they are usually wrong. When you have, uh, uh, in general, you can say that uh, it's very hard to fit exactly with a forecast to the actual demand because usually there will be so much uncertainty that you will miss. But a good forecast will be uh, in the uh, well, uh, approximately uh, close to the actual demand, and a bad for forecast will of course be be far away. And then having a good forecast method is really uh, important even if you're not able to meet exactly the demand for the, uh, the given periods. And also a good forecast will be more than a single number. It's not just that you will probably sell 30 items next Tuesday, but you can have a probability here. The mean or the expected forecast for, for the demand will be one example, for example, 30 items, but you can have a standard deviation, for example, which uh, will explain uh, how the, the probability of uh, 
that particular and also th that particular uh, outcome and also uh, how much the uh, you can expect to uh, the deviation to be from from that uh, number and you can also have a range a high and a low you will sell between 20 and 40 items uh, probably 30 with a standard deviation uh, given uh, as, as a number. That will be a much better forecast than one particular single number. Um, aggregate forecast, usually more accurate uh, forecast. Uh, one example which we will come back to later is uh, different types of washing uh, machine, I think, or some electri electronic uh, um, uh, items, that you have different types and to have a forecast for each particular type of, uh, uh, of washing machine might be difficult, but you can have an aggregate forecast that say that you will probably sell 30 washing machine uh, next week. But the deviation between the, the different types is not uh, always that easy to, to forecast. So have an aggregate forecast, you will usually be more accurate than having an uh, forecast on uh, on a lower level per uh, type. Also, accuracy erodes as we go further into the future. Some new information, some new products can appear in the market, for example, which will also uh, be uh, depend on, uh, on on your uh, sales, the demand for your product. So, um, uh, a forecast for the very near future will usually be much more accurate than. Uh, if you go further into the future. And also, what is very important here, forecasts should not be used to the exclusion of known information. Uh, forecasts are a guess. You can have very advanced model of forecasting, but anyway, what you know, orders that actually are placed, are more accurate information than a forecast phone by a method. So, the forecast should be in addition to known information and should use it in addition to other uh, known uh, wh what you actually know. Uh, but you should not just uh, trust any model that gives you an answer, but you should try to, to have, an, uh, understand and, and understand, have an understanding of, of the full uh, uh, market and, and, and the forecasting uh, uh, problems. So, what makes a good forecast? Timely. It should be as accurate as possible, but also important, not more accurate than necessary. There's no need to have a forecast since you have the, uh, since you ha usually have uncertainty anyway. It's no need to have a very accurate forecast because uh, it, uh, the uncertainty will usually be so high that it, it will be superfluous to have one. Uh, accurate, uh, <coughs> a more accurate forecast than, than necessary. Of course, it should be reliable, meaningful units, and presented in writing. And also, the method should be easy to use and easy to understand in most in most cases. Um, usually, in uh, larger companies, there are several people uh, involved in the planning, uh, well, uh, while, while planning uh, and, and deciding strategy. And uh, if possible, all of them should use, uh, should be able to use and also to understand the forecasting methods. So, some kind of forecast horizon. We can also see that we have the small horizon here of days and week, which is, gives you a short time sale shift schedule, how many people to uh, employ in each uh, shift of a day, for example, and also the resource requirement, how much of each, uh, each of the, sub uh, uh, the components and uh, uh, sub-products should you <coughs> actually have available for the daily production. Uh, then you have uh, some kind of what we call the intermediate time horizon, which is in usually in weeks and months. Uh, then product family sales, also a more uh, uh, the labor needs, how many people should you employ, not exactly uh, the details of how many should work in each shift, but how many should you, uh, should you employ for the season, for example. And also 
resource requirements at a higher level than this particular day-to-day uh, -day planning. And then for the longer forecasting horizon, which means mo months and, and years, the capacity needs, should you buy a new machine? Is that necessary for, for production? Since if you are uh, expecting uh, uh, the demand to, to grow, for example. Uh, also, are there any long-term sales patterns on your particular product? And also some kind of growth uh, trends in, in the market. So here you have different time horizon and different, uh, uh, well, all the planning done in all these uh, types of, of short, intermediate and long time horizon are dependent on the forecast. Uh, but the details of the forecast will usually be, be higher at the lower level and the forecast for a longer time period also might need to, uh, to have some kind of, of patterns uh, regarding growth or uh, what is actually happening in, in your market with this particular product. And so here we have different types of pattern of the demand. We can see the first here, which is more or less random. This is the time horizon uh, at the time. This is historical data. Most uh, forecasting methods are based <laughs> on historical data, what is, has actually happened before, because that can give you some kind of uh, information of what will also happen in the future. Uh, this figure is very, well, purely random. It's no pattern at all here. This is the first time period. This is the next. So we have some kind of low, uh, of a decreasing trend here, but then it's up again and it's varying a bit. So it's very hard, according to studying this data here, it's very hard to find some kind of, of pattern because it, it is more or less random. And forecasting methods in such situation will usually be to find some kind of line which will represent the average or the expected demand according to some uh, deviation, uh, minim minimum deviation from the line here. We should uh, look at such uh, methods for, for such situation uh, a bit later today and also continue next week. And then we have some more, what we call, can call advanced trends. Here it's clearly an in increasing linear trend. You start at a low level and then for each time period you have some kind of increasing trend. So if this is a product where you, according to some other information, can expect that this trend will continue, of course it will not continue forever, at some time, uh, these trends will start to, to decrease, but for short, uh, short, time, uh, um, short time forecasting, you can use a trend line, find a trend line like this, and try to forecast the future by using that one. If this is today, then if you are forecasting for next week, we can continue the line and say that we will expect to have a sales which is approximately at this level. In this types of methods here, we will expect, we will find one average number and expect that the sales will stay at that number until we eventually can try to, to analyze and find some, some more information regarding trends and, and other information on, on the sales. We have also what we here call the curvy linear trend or quadratic or exponential, where you can see that you have a start at a very low level and then you will have some kind of uh, exponential growth that you suddenly something will happen in this market, which means that you will have a very high sales for a short period usually. Uh, of course, here it's also very relevant that this will not continue forever. At some time you will meet the, meet the top and, and, and start, to, uh, start to, to decrease again. And here <coughs> we also have a linear trend, like we can see here, but we will also consider seasonal differences. This could be typical uh, well, winter sports equipment, for example, skis, 
similar equipment usually sold most in in the winter in the winter season and then have a low demand in the summer season still according to this trend line we can identify that the sales in general are increasing from one year to another for example uh, but there will be seasonal differences and you should now try to find the some kind of percentage or the uh, deviation for each season according to or each period in, in a season according to this trend line so for example in January you might have 50% more sales than the trend line and in July you might have 50% uh, less sales than according to, to the trend line. So here you have different types of trends and you will learn later in the course methods for at least finding an average in a random, uh, a random uh, pattern here, finding uh, using methods for identifying linear trends and also methods for identifying linear trends and with seasonal differences. So, yeah, also some notations here first used in the textbook. We have the D, which is the past values of the series to be predicted, the demand. If we are making a forecast for period T, then assume we have observed, uh, we are making a forecast in period T, that which means that we are forecasting for the next period. Then we have the observation, the historical values for T, time period T, time period T minus 1, T minus 2, and for some, uh, some period uh, in, in into, the, uh, into the past. So here the capital Ds are actually historical values of the sales, which is used to, uh, to find or uh, to, to find a forecasting method and to find a forecast for the future. And similar, when the capital D is the historical demand, the capital F is the forecast made here in period T for a period into the future. If we are now in period T, we might be called, uh, uh, well, we can call that zero, and then we are making a forecast for the next period, then the F021 will be the forecast made in period zero to the next period. But we can also make a forecast for several periods into the future, and then we have to add this, uh, this is the Greek letter tau, which might be a number one, two, three, and so on, which then describes how many periods into the future we are going to make a forecast. And this is, if we go back to the uh, go back to this here, uh, when you have a linear trend, you if this is today, we are making a forecast into the future. One period into the future will be to continue the growth of this line two periods, for, for one period, two periods into the future will be to continue even further. So this will now be important when you are making the forecast and also how many periods you are into the future you are making a forecast. Uh, so here, yeah, the F of T minus 1 T is the forecast made in period t minus 1, a, period, uh, a previous time period, for period t, and then t plus 1 will be the forecast made in t for t plus 1, one step ahead. So this is the, the notation used here. The capital D is the actual historical demand, and the capital F is the forecast and you can also read from the indexes here that which period the forecast is made and for which period you are making a forecast. Okay, before we look at some examples, I will also say something about evaluating the forecasts. Here we have different types of 
what we call forecast error um, and different kind of measures of the forecast. Uh, the forecast error will then be the difference between the forecast of the demand and the actual value of the demand. You might have made a forecast for this particular period uh, last month and then you can uh, see and observe what is the actual demand and then you can find the uh, forecast error as the difference between the forecast and the actual demand. So here the small e will then be uh, describe the forecast error and here we have the forecast given in one particular period for period t minus the actual demand for period t and then for one step ahead forecast you will have the same same index t here but as just mentioned you can also look to the forecast error made several periods back in time we describe the MAD, MAD, or Mean Average Deviation, by this formula, looking at the sum of the forecast errors, the sum of the difference between the forecast and the actual demand, <coughs> divided by the number of observations. This will be the Mean Average uh, Deviation. Oh, and mean absolute deviation, of course. Absolute deviation, this is an absolute value, which means that even if the forecast is higher or lower than the actual demand, you are measuring the distance from the forecast to the demand. So use the absolute value. Mean absolute deviation is the average deviation for all the given time periods, all the n time periods. And we also can use what we call the mean squared error, which is the still the average divided by the number of observations. But now you should take the sum of the square of the forecast error. And of course, this will be much uh, more uh, uh, dependent if you have one very large deviation for one uh, one period this will when you square that large number it will be much higher or and uh, this mean square error will then uh, then have uh, a much higher value if you have some large uh, forecast errors in in some periods then the similar will be for the mean absolute deviation if you still if you uh, fit uh, almost exactly the forecast with the demand for 11 months, but have a large deviation in the 12th month. The mean absolute deviation might not be so high, but the mean square error might be very high since you are, uh, you are using the square or to the power of two of this large deviation for one particular month. So this will be a difference here. If if you are dependent on a more stable uh, sale or, or forecast, you should usually look more to the mean square error. And when you're comparing different methods, for example, uh, you will see that the method with this <coughs> lowest value on, on this measure <coughs> will probably be the best in, in such uh, situations. <coughs> Okay, then we will look at uh, yeah, at least one one method before we uh, finish for today. Uh, we will go back to this stationary series, the situation here, uh, where it's of course it's not exactly stationary, but we cannot observe a trend. So we will now try to to develop forecasting method for a situation <coughs> where you don't know about any dependency on in the uh, in the data you assume that the demand in the future will be totally uh, random not uh, dependent on what has happened before so you will try to find a method that will describe 
the forecast as one particular number and assume that this number will continue. Of course, when new data is registered, then this line can either increase or decrease according to how would the new data affect this model. But still, you don't expect to have a trend, you don't expect to have a season, and no, at least uh, not any uh, quadratic or exponential trend. So here we should just try to find a value which describe typically a for, uh, the demand and which we can use for forecasting the, the future. Uh, we have two methods. I will present the first one today. Uh, one method is called the moving averages. And another one, which we will then present next Tuesday, is the exponential smoothing. <coughs> Moving averages means, in short, you are taking the average of a certain number of, uh, of the latest observed data. For example, you can take the, the average of the three last periods. Then the average of this, this, and this value. And then when you get new data, the oldest will be removed from the set and the new data will be uh, included. And then, of course, if you have a very high value here, then the average will be higher than the previous one. If you have a low value, the average will be lower. Uh, the exponential smoothing is some kind of different because the exponential smoothing will define uh, the importance of the last measured value compared with the last forecast. So here on the moving averages each of the three latest, if you use three as the number, will count equally on the exponential smoothing, you will define how important is the last measured value, the newest data in the set, uh, compared to the previous forecast. So first, try to look at the first one, the MA, moving averages strategy. And then we have to decide how many, the decision here will be the large N, which is the number of observation, the recent uh, observations, which should be included. Number of observations. And uh, I mentioned in my first uh, example when trying to explain it, I mentioned n number three, so we should also use in, in the example uh, a moving average of three, which means find the average of the three most recent observations. And then we have the formula for making the forecast. Um, for Here, if, uh, if we don't have two indexes, we usually use the, the forecast for period T here as the average one divided by this capital N number of observations included and the demand for the previous um, plus the demand for the second previous and eventually the demand for t minus n, the sum of the n most recent observation. And when n is equal to 3, it will be the sum of the three most recent observations. So I will shortly go through the example on uh, page number 65 in the textbook, if you have that. I uh, will also show those of you who haven't bought it yet, I will just repeat 
the numbers. Page 65. Uh, we have now start with the three first periods here, the observations. N is equal to 3. We have the observations. Let's now say D. Um, yeah, call that minus 3. The third um, or the, the first observation in the set, which is 200. And then the second observation, we now assume that we are on uh, period number uh, 0. So we have the three previous observations on the d minus 1, minus 2, and minus 3. Uh, second observation is 250. And third observation, minus 1, the most recent observation, will be 175. <coughs> and the example states also more observation, but we will now look on these three observations. Which means that we should now try to make a forecast based on these three observations. We are now on the border, or on uh, while well we are in uh, period number zero, and we will try to make a forecast for the uh, for the demand in that particular uh, period. Which means that here. F0 will now be 1 divided by 3. And the sum of D for minus 1, minus 2, and minus 3. Multiplied by 200 plus 250 plus 175. Which means that the forecast according to this method will be approximately 208 if we round to the, the closest integer. This means we have three observations. We are uh, using these observations in a moving average method. We will find out that the forecast will be 208. Eight. And now let's see what happens. We are in D0. We get a new observation which was 186. This means the forecast was not correct. The forecast was different from what we actually had in demand in this period. That means we can now find the error forecast error as the difference between the forecast and the demand difference between 208 and 186, which is 22. This is the forecast error for this particular period. And then, after a while of uh, using this method, we can also uh, calculate the MAD, the mean average the mean absolute deviation and the MSD, mean square error, based on these forecast errors for each of the periods. So, okay, let's now continue more into the future. We have a new observation. Then we can also make a new forecast. And then this will be the forecast number one, since we now have come to period zero, started on minus three, come to zero. Forecast number one, for period number one, when you are in period zero, is one divided by three. The number is still the same, but now we should not include the oldest data, but we should just use the three most recent observations. Which means 
250 plus 175 plus 186. And this should now be a forecast of 204, approximately, rounding to the closest integer. And here we can see that this is different than the previous one, even if this is a random or stationary series. We don't have a trend or any known trend at least. But by using such a method, uh, we are able to adjust the forecast for period to period. Old data are just removed from the set and new data are included. And since the value or the demand here in period 0, 186, is smaller than the period uh, 200, which is excluded from the set, then the forecast will be smaller than in the previous <coughs> period. Okay, we can try to see what is the new observation here. D, well, we have now, since we started <coughs> counting at minus 1, we have now come to, to period number 1. And we have a forecast for period number 1, which is 204. And we have a new demand, which is set to be 225. This is the actual demand looking at the, that particular period in hi as historical data. Then we can again find the forecast error for period 1 as the difference between the forecast and the demand difference between the forecast of 204 and a demand of 225, which means we have minus 21. But when calculating the mean absolute deviation, as we remember, we use the absolute value. So here we have a deviation of 21 between the forecast and the actual demand. And then Again, new data has arrived. We can make a new forecast. So the <laughs> forecast for period 2 will then be still 1 divided by 3. Now we should include these three most recent values, which means 175 plus 186 plus 225, which will give us a forecast of something, yeah, I haven't actually done the calculations on my sheet, but this will be a bit lower than 204, since the value of 250, which is excluded, is higher than the included value of 225. And so we can continue when we get new data, we can update the forecast. But what is important to know, the forecast here given for period number one, for example, 204. If you are asked in period zero, what is the forecast for period five? The number is still this one, because this is the only information we have. We are calculating a forecast which will be valid into the future until we get some more information. And we don't know about any trends or seasons which are included in some models we will see later in this course. But here for the stationary series, we will find the forecast as one particular number, which should be, uh, well, since we don't have any more information, we can assume that this will be the forecast also for, for the coming periods. OK, I have one Excel sheet which I will upload uh, just <coughs> after this lecture which shows first this, uh, uh, this moving average method with this data here. And here we have the moving average of uh, 3. So, and here I started counting of 1 instead of minus 3. But anyway, the is still the same. Uh, so this is the moving average of 3. Similar, you have a moving average of 6, which makes us only possible to make a forecast for period 7 and 8 in, in this data set. So 
if you want to look at the exponential smoothing method, which I will present next Tuesday, we can also have a look at this uh, example here. So I will upload this uh, Excel sheet on, on Fronter just after this lecture, and then you can have a look at it. And as mentioned, next Tuesday, I will also present the first assignment, which is a pass or fail assignment. Okay, that's enough for today. Fronter page don't work by, um, uh, by us, but you don't can find the room. You can't find the room no. in Fronter. Okay. If it's possible that you maybe send us the uh, important.